Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the regional office for Thomson Reuters. My name is Sanjeev Chatrath, and I'm responsible for the financial and risk business for Asia Pacific at Thomson Reuters. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you today to the office over here. Uh, as most of you would be familiar, Thomson Reuters is a world leader in delivering trusted news, legal, tax and accounting, and financial and risk solutions. So it is my honor today to welcome you over here. Our, our organization has been delivering those solutions for more than 167 years across more than 100 countries, many of those for more than 100 years. Here in Hong Kong, we are going to be celebrating our 150 year anniversary next year, which talks at length about the strength uh, and the legacy of the organization. Uh, one of those unique parts of our organization is our news organization, where more than 2,500 journalists across 100 countries deliver trusted news every single day. Uh, and part of the conversation today is, is going to be a great example of that trusted, uh, unbiased, independent news. Uh, alongside with our news organization, financial and risk business, which is what I'm responsible for, helps us to deliver and connect the financial community. So whether you are a chief operating officer, research analyst, a buy-side firm, or a sell-side firm, our open platform enables you to connect, discover, build relationship, and transact in a safe, efficient, and effective manner. Our, our Newsmaker event is a very unusual event because it is in front of a live audience. It is getting live streamed. And at any point in time, we estimate there's all, approximately a potential audience of about a million people. So I'll request everybody who's here in this particular room, if you can be quiet while the conversations are going on. And there will be an opportunity for us to have an inter interaction with you and for you to ask questions uh, with Charles. Uh, hosting the conversation today is Anne-Marie Ront Rontry. And Anne-Marie really doesn't require much of an introduction. She's been our Hong Kong bureau chief since 2014. And she joined Reuters in 2002 in Singapore and has had extensive experience across finance, companies, political, news desk uh, across the world. Prior to working with Reuters, Anne-Marie also worked with the Irish Times in Dublin and with the South China Morning Post here in Hong Kong. And of course, the star of the conversation today is Charles Lee. Charles is the chief executive for Hong Kong Exchange and Clearing, and he has really been spearheading the transformation for the exchange since he joined uh, in 2010. With an experience more than 25 years, Charles has obviously been shaping the evolution of Hong Kong Exchange over the last many years. Very significant milestones in terms of the shift, both to evolve into fixed income, commodities, and currencies uh, um, assets, and also with the, with the mutual access programs, as Charles has been leading, uh, both for the Stock Connect and most recently with the Bond Connect. There is an old saying that if you want to go fast, you go alone, and if you want to go far, you go together. Thomson Reuters is also very uniquely privileged to be working with Exchange since its inception uh, at, at the start. Over the years, we've had a lot of opportunities to work together and build on our partnership. Most recently, last year, we co-branded co uh, Renminbi Indices, uh, which we brought to the market. And this year, uh, TradeWeb, which is a market-leading fixed income trading platform, majority owned by Thomson Reuters, helped connect the China foreign exchange trade system through the Bond Connect program. And there are a number of other similar examples of how we partner along with the exchange. So I'm extremely proud of the relationship we share with the exchange. I'm looking forward to the conversation today. At this stage, I'm going to request Charles to come and make a few, few comments. And, and then after that, Anne-Marie will start the discussion. Charles. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. I just want to keep the remar initial remarks brief so that we can get the dialogue going. I think uh, you know, uh, you know, we are a big advocate you know, uh, uh, for the Hong Kong market and for Hong Kong's role as the international financial center. So exactly what we, you know, what is our yesterday, what is our today, and what we're going to be doing tomorrow. And so we clearly, over the last 30 years, Hong Kong has been instrumental for China's growth. You know, it's essentially we did three key things you know, for China, or China has done three key things during the last 30 years, trade, and FDI and uh, uh, capital market. Trade gave China the first bucket of gold, and then FDI made China into the manufacturing of the world. And the capital market development essentially made China's insurance companies, cap and, you know, telecom companies, banks, into the largest capitalization you know, companies globally. And the Hong Kong was essentially you know, the primary facilitator of that three major trend. And that but that three major things over the last 30 years is largely characterized 
by capital importation. So essentially, China has been a capital-deprived nation seeking capital to develop, and we have been China's primary offshore capital formation center over the last 30 years. That's a singular role. We have two customers, Chinese users of capital, international investors of capital that congregate in Hong Kong through IPO market initially, and then trade, and our market become a 30-some trillion Hong Kong dollar market from about three trillion back in the early 90s. So that's a pretty simple business role for Hong Kong. Looking at today, however, China is already the second largest economy, the second largest financial market, but the financial market is still largely closed. But that closedness is no longer a one-way open, you know, for China, like its economic system back joining the WTO. Today's China's financial market, the capital market, is a very different market. It is a very established market. It's a very big and deep market. And that market has a huge growth potential because there's only seven trillion US dollar in market cap for the domestic market. But the banking assets is 20 some trillion US dollars. That relationship is a totally distorted. In the US, it will be the other way around. So which means that not only its own market is already the second largest equity market today in the world, a huge potential, the banking assets will, over time, move that into the fixed income and equity. But that market is already fundamentally different from ours. In many, many ways, that they actually think their market is more advanced than ours in terms of infrastructure, in terms of hardware, in terms of how they regulate and how they manage the account systems and the clearing and the risk management system there. So with the two fundamental systems that they are no longer willing like they used to be, totally changed their market to fit into the global norm. And we obviously highly interested in facilitating international investors into China, are not able to change our own way of doing things just to fit into China. With that fundamental conflicting model, Hong Kong's role become even more important today and into the future. We are essentially here to connect two very different systems, to connect two systems that are either unwilling or unable to truly connect physically, simply because of the rules are different, the infrastructures are different, the trading cultures are different, and the political and the regulatory philosophy are so different that we can no longer expect and hope that will naturally converge. So therefore, Hong Kong's role is now to facilitate that. We will become a converter, we'll become a translator, we will become the round and square pipes connector to make sure that they can actually physically. So the Connect program is all about not making neither side to change, but at the same time allow the two systems to be able to be connected so that Chinese investors can sit at home but able to invest internationally in Hong Kong underlines, and conversely, international investors can go through Hong Kong and directly invest into China without having to move money and open new accounts. So that is really our business model. So over time, now the Hong Kong role will begin to change. Instead of just channeling international capital into China, now it is allowing people to directly invest into China rather than through just the listed issuers from China in Hong Kong. But more importantly, more structurally, is to help the Chinese domestic capital to deploy internationally on, you know, through their systems. China will continue to exercise significant amount of capital control even in the most easier times, let alone more challenging times like today. So how to help China deploy that capital in a way that is comforting to their political and regulatory philosophy, but allow the market to act rather than through some special policy initiatives is a very key role that we can play in Hong Kong. In that connection, Another very important issue that we have been all hearing and debating is the Belt and Road Initiative of China and how Hong Kong can play a role in there because it's very fashionable talking about it, but unless we're really looking at the fundamental structure issues and the desires and the possible implications of Belt and Road, we will never, it's just not going to happen unless we are all truly understand it. We, again, there, I think Hong Kong has a very unique role to play because Belt and Road is not a Marshall Plan. It's not an A program. It's not free. China have a lot of money. China have a lot of capacity. China is willing to export that B 
be the first mover and be the person who can take the first loss to get the co-cooperation going so that the entire 50 some 60 countries in that area are able to focus on infrastructure first because infrastructure is the key enabler of regional growth. But infrastructure itself is also not gonna give you the kind of returns that is needed for you to be able to fund on a large scale. China today is willing to be that first mover and the catalyst to make that happen. But that is only a catalyst. It's almost like a building a building. China is willing to be that steel inside the concrete, but you still need rocks, you still need cement, you still need water, you still need everything from the market to make that entire building an entire initiative alive. So Hong Kong here is able to do that. Why? Because China today is willing to put money today for future returns, is willing to put money in unprofitable infrastructures, unprofitable on their own, but it will have huge knock-on economic benefit for the country, but how to make sure that that benefit can actually ultimately come back and guarantee the returns on that energy investment. Otherwise, they won't really be able to sustain. And so changing today's money into tomorrow's, mon tomorrow's money, changing, allowing China to put the money up front but have some comfort of some sort of returns into the, you know, back into China is the key to sustain that first mover catalyst. But most of those countries may or may not be able to use its own full faith and credit to really guarantee that investment. And those, many of those countries probably are not able to because otherwise they would have been already able to do that by now. So how to make sure that what they do have let's say resources, let's say energy, let's say other things that can be collateralized or can be pursed, market priced first. And then that market priced collateral could become the backbone for continued fixing income financing. So Hong Kong could be that converter. That converter is not only about different systems talking and converting to each other, is also about converting people's rights, converting equity to debt converting debt to equity, converting today's money to tomorrow's money, converting resources to value, converting value to collateral, collateral converting collateral into actual fixed income investment, and that fixed income investment hopefully will allow the country to develop the market much faster, and everything, however, started with companies and countries and China putting their interests together and we become the big swap. We become the big swatting machine where we can change today's money into tomorrow's money. We can change the resources into equity value. We can change the equity value into collateral for fixed income. That allow a virtuous cycle to build. And why Hong Kong can do that? Because Hong Kong again has this unique system of one country, two systems where we enjoy the trust and the confidence from China but on the other hand, we operate in a two system that allow us to also enjoy the same confidence and trust from the, all those international companies and markets. And we are the one, we are the neutral arbitrator, we are the neutral converter, and we are allowing all the interests to be here, to be aligned so that we can keep this great train going on a sustainable basis. So yesterday, we were a facilitator of capital flow into China. Today, we increasingly becoming the pricing center for China, the risk management center for China, and ultimately we price equity, we price commodities, we also price the most important assets, which is currency, which is renminbi. And that allows us to use that to essentially facilitate this great, you know, people think it's a geopolitical play, but I actually think this is probably the biggest economic initiative that can be possibly implemented on that sort of a scale with China taking that leadership, taking the first loss, but then catalyst it so that we can start a tremendously successful and sustainable, you know, uh, 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 virtual cycle to get this, get us out of this chicken and egg, you know, uh, and difficulty and dilemma and to be able to allow China to take that leadership and take the region, take Belt and Road, into new prosperity. Thank you. Okay. Go back. Okay. On this side? Yes, you on the far side. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yep. So 
Charles, thanks again for joining us today. Thank you. Um, less than eight weeks ago, Chief Executive Carrie Lam mm -hmm. was sitting exactly where we are sitting now. And she said at the time that she'd love to get the city's regulators, the city's market practitioners, lock them in a room and see if they could hammer out the way forward. She also said that she was fed up with consultations um, and she said that she thought the city lacked strong financial leadership. What's your response to that? Well, we, we have a new administration that I start to see tremendous amount of energy, tremendous amount of vision, and tremendous amount of determination to get things done. I think uh, in Hong Kong, it's time for us to stop a lot of the talking and start doing doing something that is important. We have a hugely successful hands of card, and we just have to make sure we play it well. Um, so we have a lot of financial professionals obviously here today. Um, we were wondering what update you could give us at all on um, consultations um, for the third board. Obviously the consultations wrapped up on August the 18th. Where are we at now and what can we expect over the next few months? Yeah, the consultation closed uh, about two weeks ago. We're going through the feedbacks. It's, uh, it's one of those uh, very, very uh, popular uh, you know, consultations. We actually received uh, you know, hundreds of feedback. Uh, we essentially ask uh, a few questions. Do we want it to find ways to attract new economy companies into Hong Kong? Uh, overwhelming, yes. Do we want it to um, you know, uh, consider potentially allowing pre-profit or even pre-revenue companies in the new economy to come. I think there's a tremendous amount of uh, uh, interest in wanting for us to find a way to facilitate that. And third, if we think it's necessary, you know, um, do we think we, you know, we would like to introduce potentially weighted voting rights to allow you know, some of those major companies to be listed here? I think the answer is very strongly in favor of that as well. On the other hand, people are also wanting to make sure that if we do do that, we also provide sufficient safeguards and protective measures for investors so that that does not become um, pot, you know, potentially to be abused. And then the next question you know, ask is, do we really allow secondary listings you know, that is already and, you know, listed in New York or other jurisdictions to come back to Hong Kong to list without having to go through uh, and jumping through all the loops again. And finally, uh, the question is, uh, a lot of feedback is essential to say, why do you want to do a new board? If we want to do all the new things, why don't we just do that together in the main board? So those are really the broader feedbacks, and I think it's a very, very positively uh, you know, received. And um, I don't have a timetable yet, but we are in very intensive discussions with the relevant stakeholders to you know, essentially generate a conclusion out of those feedbacks, as divergent as they are, into action plans. We most likely will come out, hopefully, in the coming weeks, definitely months, and hope absolutely not years, and, um, you know, in, you know, so that we can actually come out and say, when, one, whether or not uh, we will create a special, either a board, a segment, or chapter, you know, for new economy, and whether or not we will allow a weighted voting right. And if we do allow weighted voting right, what are the, in the system we're gonna put in there? And we probably will have to go through another round of uh, you know, rule consultation, but that's how we do it. But that's more about the weather issue is resolved. It's how to do it is going to come into uh, the next round of consultation. But we will provide a conclusion and uh, hopefully another round of rule consultation shortly after that, if not together. Okay, and overall, so what kind of time frame would you be looking at? The Funds Association has called for another consultation on what has just been. Um, will there be another consultation on what you've just had, or you'll be moving on, you'll have, as you say, conclusion, and then another um, consultation after that? Well, the, the, the first round that just finished was what we call a concept consultation. Mm -hmm. Essentially is asking the question, do we want to do that as a weather question. And I think we have essentially received a largely yes. 
and uh, we obviously going to, you know, trying to analyze that and to make sure exactly what sort of a handicap that yes, this much, this yes, or this sort of yes on this side. And with a yes established, then the issue is how to get, for example, weighted voting right. Yeah. Exactly who is qualified to do that? Whether or not there are going to be any sunset provisions that, uh, or whether or not you can pass to your son or your daughter. And, uh, and also if, if it's going to be a, this kind of a waiting voting right, are we going to have any specific issues about uh, you know, potential eventuality that it could eventually be a, a sunset provision? So those are the how, mm. what we call a rule consultation, which is essentially saying we're going to do it, but here's how exactly we're going to do it. Can you tell us whether or not you have any comments on whether we should tweak it this way or tweak sure. that way? So you're saying overall the broad, consult the broad consensus for those, um, for what is up for consultation. Broadly, the consensus appears to be overwhelmingly yes. Well, I should not, and you know, uh, and you know, uh, because the, the con conclusion itself will sure. say exactly what it is. But I'm, you know, is just speaking my yeah. own perception of it. And you know, I, I, I obviously have not read every single feedback, sure. but the perception, the broader feeling, because I do have to tell the government, of you course. know, you know, uh, what is our preliminary. Uh, assessment. So that's my personal view about the so broader the, so, so, tune. So that there is, there does seem to be kind of the closest agreement that we've probably had on these issues as yet. I believe so. Okay. Yes. Um, so also, obviously, the third board, you know, some people have referred to it as a trash board. There's, you know, there has been concerns over, um, over the quality of some companies. How would you reassure um, investors on that? Yeah, I think it's highly irresponsible to use words like that. You know, that I consider to be a trash comment, to be perfectly honest. And uh, because that's not serious. Serious people discuss serious issues seriously. And uh, seriously, we're talking about here is, you know, when you see trash companies, you know, you usually meant bad companies behavior-wise, conduct-wise. You know, companies can become highly risky and the business can fail. That's part of investment. That's, you know, you know, so when you have new economy companies, when you have NASDAQ, if you look at the company listed on NASDAQ vis-a-vis -vis NYSE, by definition, the percentage of failures of company listed in NASDAQ is a lot higher than a traditional market like NYSE, at least in the past. That doesn't make NASDAQ any you know, more trashy than anything else is simply because the company listed, they're bona fide companies, but they're innovative and they're in new frontier. Drug companies it may not work sometimes. And, uh, but when we talk about misconduct, when we talk about manipulation of market, when we talk about a you know, company that choose not to you know, be in compliance with the rules, those are truly you know, bad actors. And there we need to take proactive and aggressive regulatory enforcement actions, which is what we are doing. Mm -hmm. well, if we also think certain part of a vetting process could be beefed up to ensure us to be able to detect some of those companies early on, that would be perfect. But it's very important for people to understand that um, the listing regulation having to do with <laughs> vetting is uh, almost like giving you a driver's license. The life after you get the license is a lot longer than the time you spend with the driving school and with the testing authorities. And a lot of people ended up become a problem, either a criminal or drunk driving or speeding or do other things on the road with a perfectly valid issued a driver's license. By somehow implying that uh, if somebody does something on the road, you know, bad, the police should not have issued that driver's license to that person is a little bit hard to sometimes to uh, appreciate because as a rule of law, uh, as a, you know, a, a market with uh, believing in uh, you know, freedom of contract and uh, you know, d full disclosure, many of those companies are fully qualified to list, but that sometimes also no guarantee that there may become problems into the future. So I think while we're focusing on the vetting, I think it's, it's unrealistic for us to somehow believe vetting can guarantee that no bad actors get onto the market. Mm -hmm. 
in many ways, the philosoph and the different regulatory philosophy is that our philosophy is that everybody is presumed to be innocent until you prove otherwise. Rather than somehow we assume everybody is you know, uh, guilty until you prove you're innocent, and then we give you a, you know, a listing and you know, status. Mm -hmm. That's not how things work here. It maybe works different places. So in terms of regulatory oversight, there's obviously been a, um, a lot of debate between the role of the HKEX and of the SFC. Um, is there, is there any case, would you see any case for relinquishing more control to the, to the SFC? Well, SFC already has all the controls that, you know, that they needed under the law. And, uh, you know, our system is a very, very, it works quite well, you know, and, uh, you know, you are, there are always nuances as to, you know, certain things that you could move one way or the other. You know, you know don't forget, our market is not a very massive domestic market like either China or the U.S. that you have a fundamentally local, lean, you know, a, a, a local characteristic driving it. Our market is a market between big rocks. You know, we're in the gap. We are a small jurisdiction, a small population, a small physical mass. So this market, in order for us to survive and thrive, we have to be adaptive. We have to be innovative. We have to be competitive. So which essentially, you know, is one of the reasons that we have had this particular regulatory structure where both regulation and development are the due mandates of both the SFC and the exchange. And we obviously are slightly more focusing, you know, on the development side because we have a large commercial operation side of our business that are not in the regulatory side. We have a Chinese ward off listening division that are dedicated to regulation. And the SFC obviously is completely regulatory in nature, even though its mandate is also include developing this market. So I think it's, a, it's really a nice way for us to, you know, kind of a divide our responsibilities and define our, you know, respective area. In many ways, we're the junior regulator on the front line and they're the senior regulator slightly on the back line, but they have always had the authority to be on the front line whenever necessary. You know, I use the analogy that we are the traffic cops and they're there, the, the sheriff. So they clearly can tell the traffic cop what to do and not to do. And if they think we're not doing enough of a good job, and they can, you know, there are many means available to them to make a difference. They can also directly, you know, wave their big gun and get on the street whenever they deem to be necessary and appropriate. But our market expect that uh, the traffic cop is not, its job is not only to capture every bad actor, traffic job is some let the traffic move smoothly. If you have somebody who just uh, happened to speed and then, you know, you know, had a, a you know, or, and just bumped a red light, occasionally you actually make a decision to say, maybe for the broader traffic and the traffic peak hours, I'm not going to chase this guy down. I'm not going to just block it. I'm going to find a way, different way to find it later to how to deal with him rather than blocking everybody. But occasionally the cop have to wave the big gun, the big you know machine, and then chase down. And if that means that somebody get knocked over, so sure. be it. Okay. Those are different choices. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to move on to listings. Obviously, you know, attracting big listings is is a, a big push, a big drive for the HKEX. Um, it's been a while since we've had a banner listing in Hong Kong. Obviously, the big talk at the moment is Saudi Aramco. Um, how confident are you that Hong Kong would be able to clinch that deal? Well, I think, uh, you know, when we talk about attracting, that's the wrong word. Because attracting, people do list in your market because there's something fundamentally they can get out of the market that they need. When you use the word attracting, you either make do a makeup or you make accommodations, you change. We cannot do that. You know, our system is a very stable system of rule of law. We're not going to say, oh, this guy wants that, let's do that. You know. You know, for the waiting voting right for Alibaba, for example, it took us three, four years, and we're still debating now, okay. right? So we are not really attracting. What we are trying to do is to set up the system so that the people, the investor, and the issuer truly feel that they can get the best deal here. In the case of Saudi Remco, yes. you know, if you allow me to just quickly, Saudi needs something. Saudi doesn't need 
Saudi has a huge need of use, you know, you know, essentially having one of its largest customer in oil crude. China is now the largest importer of Saudi crude to be their shareholders. Because that allows Saudi to really tie up you know, its customer and shareholder relationship together. And if we are able to use renminbi to subscribe you know, Saudi shares, and Saudi can use the renminbi to buy US sov and, you know, China sovereign you know, um, and treasury bills, that sort of a swap allows Saudi the 2030 vision to essentially diversify from energy, diversify from dollar, diversify from a pure political, geopolitical relationship in North America. So it gets a huge boost for that, number one. Number two, whatever they decide, whether they list in London or mm -hmm. list in New York on the Western Hemisphere listing, having a rival liquidity pool that is supported by domestic Chinese liquidity that trades and invests in a very different valuation and risk profile allows them to work on two legs you know, on global at a different time, you know, a, a different clock of trading. For China, if you're able to allow Chinese investors to invest in the biggest oil company where oil goes up, China suffers, but oil goes up, stocks goes up, and it's a natural hedge for China. And if that, China also allow this sort of a primary connect to work in Hong Kong, then the money they invested is actually inside the domestic infrastructure. So there's huge win-win if yeah. we can put this match in heaven together, and Hong Kong is the only place we can put that together, but easier said than done, huge of challenges. Of course, are you still in talks with them? Well, them, who is them? Aramco. The them is everybody. The You're them is Saudi Remco, the rem is China, the rem is investors. So and you are in talks with, um, with all the, the yeah. related parties. Talk will never stop. And, uh, and also, also, we also need to, need to think through that this is a long-term thing. Even if Saudi Remco, at the time of the IPO, this is not gonna happen. What I said today continue to be totally relevant because they're only listing let's say three to 5%, yeah. and they can do a listing somewhere, but then as soon as Primary Connect is executed, they can just simply do another listing, so. Okay, so let's move on to Primary Connect. You say this is the next big deal. Primary Connect is the next big deal. Correct. Um, and where are we at that? How far away would Primary Connect be? Well, Primary Connect, um, probably so big and it's so difficult to execute because it, is, it requires us to change particularly the domestic policymakers need to fully appreciate and understand because there is a mindset that need to change as to why we're doing this. And um, the different parts of China Inc. that will look at this issue in a very different way. Some will look at it as a geopolitically very important for China. Others will be looking at it purely from a domestic capital market dynamic perspective. And there are a lot of people in between so those conversations ultimately need to congregate to what is China's most important goal and interest that can be served by this. So I think um, you know, the reason I keep talking about Primary Connect and Saudi Aramco together is because Primary Connect is probably the most important, if not the only reason to secure a Saudi Aramco Hong Kong listing and Saudi Remco listing is probably the most important and the most effective way of achieving primary connect. That's why this two probably will come together, will be together, and, and that will f force crystallize for everybody as to why Saudi Remco, why primary connect, why they need to be in a matching heaven. And hopefully after that, the rest become history. Okay, I just want to move on. You spoke about Belt and Road, obviously, at the beginning. Um, Belt and Road, obviously, in Hong Kong, it seems to be the, the kind of the silver bullet to fix all of Hong Kong's woes. There are obviously a lot of skeptics out there as well. Um, can you just, just tell us, how can you be sure it will be a growth driver for HKEX? What specifically will HKEX do? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm not sure it will be because it's, um, you know, we need to put a lot of thoughts into it and we need to change a lot of minds. And it's also very similar to the Saudi Aramco question because, you know, um, 
there are two camps of view about Belt and Road. One more excited, somehow anything to do with uh, you know, a big sovereign China initiative get a lot of people in Hong Kong very, very excited. Um, and um, we don't really understand why, but they say, oh, it must be good. And uh, must have huge opportunities. And let's, we're going to have lawyers going to have something to do. <laughs> Accountants will have something to do there, a better road. And then you have other camps who basically are very skeptical and who basically think this is just another one of those big political initiatives and uh, what does that have anything to do with us? And I think we need to do the hard, you know, you know, you know our job as, as the Hong Kong Exchange because on the one hand, we're a very aspirational. We think we need to be ahead of the pack. We need to really think through what are the future and what the big you know, uh, stakeholders are doing and how can we fit in. On the other hand, we are tremendously commercial. You know, we also know that uh, we are tremendously respectful of the market. We think market is ultimately what really matters. If the, it, you know, you can have a lot of stories, you can have a lot of uh, themes, but if the market at the end of the day is not going to be able to fund it, it's just not going to work for an uh, operator like Hong Kong Change. The reason we think this thing could work is because you have a few people sitting around the table wanting different things, and you need something in the middle to actually get the different converted. China have a huge amount of excessive capacity that is willing to be deployed. China wanting to play a greater role in this areas where China's political and geopolitical interests ultimately you know, are very important there. So China is willing to provide tremendous amount of assistance in developing a co-development scheme. But China also distinctively know this is not a Marshall Plan. This is not something just giving away. You know, somebody has to pay for what China wants to do. But we also know the recipient countries, many of this market are still early stage market, um, politically unstable and, uh, and war torn. And how, they, how can they be the credit that you are able to provide the funding, especially when you're investing in infrastructure, which in and of itself wouldn't really provide the returns. But on the other hand, many of those countries do have things that are potentially useful, less resources oil or minerals or whatever it is. But on the other hand, a pure contractual relationship, I build an airport, you promise to give me, a role, uh, give me oil. What about if the airport is built and you change your mind? And what do I do? So that sort of thing, unless you're able to solve all these issues, the money, maybe the first batch will go and then quickly people realize that this is just a one-way street. So pumping blood into Belt and Road is not important unless there's a way for the blood to pump back into the heart. So I think that's really what we wanted to find a way in Hong Kong to make that, that happen. And you said that you're considering possibly a Belt and Road um, Index. Well, those are small tools for okay. people to use. But uh, the, the most critical one is to say to the people who want the money to build the airport and road, but don't have the money to pay today, have resources, but how to make sure that resources can be tied together with the interest of the money providers. So what the idea is, country can use the resources to list in Hong Kong. If we can use primary connect to have Chinese market together with the international market to price that resources into securities. Mm. And that security, which is held by the country, can be the collateral for China's fixed income investment into the infrastructure. That allows this equity debt mm -hmm. swap because the destination countries have a huge interest wanting to make sure the oil field continue to produce great oil because the value of the equity goes up. The value of the equity goes up, that means that the country are able to use that value, continue to collateralize more debt into the country to invest. With the collateral protected against the, borrowing, the lending, China can feel free to continue to pump money in there, knowing that if it does not really work out on the credit, it has a hand on the collateral of the value. And the collateral is a lot more valuable if the stock goes up a lot more. So it's to the interest of the recipient countries to ensure 
that goes. So we, if we can put that debt and equity interest together in a listed vehicle in Hong Kong where both sides trust, then that swap, and that converter could potentially bring everybody's interests aligned in a structured and sustainable manner. Would you consider at all looking maybe for a tie-up or looking to buy an exchange either in Southeast Asia or in Europe to be part of the Belt and Road Initiative? Is that, what's, is that something that you would consider? Uh, if I consider them, there must be a lot of reasons, and I think just the, simply because they are on, happen to be located on the Belt and Road does not fit the bill. And we're not, uh, you know, we are very expensive exchange in terms of, uh, we are very resourceful exchange. We can afford to buy a lot of things, but that doesn't mean we're going to buy any. Okay. We only bought one, and it's working out well, and we want to keep that record. Okay, so very quickly, just going back to Connect. So the, the Connect schemes, obviously, it's, it's more than three years since the Shanghai Connect launched. We've had Shenzhen, we've had Bond Connect. You've talked about Primary Connect, and that's obviously a very, very big deal. What, are there any other Connect schemes in the pipeline? Um, is there possibly a Commodities Connect scheme? Yes, we, you know, we would love to have a Commodities Connect. That would be you know, a natural extension of the Connect program. But I think uh, 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 Commodity Connect, uh, you know, I think we need to work with the domestic commodity exchange partners. Or, uh, uh, they need to feel that they can get something out of it. And uh, historically, Hong Kong has not been, uh, you know, uh, really successful in commodities. So it's harder for us to justify that we're able to provide them with something that they need. And I think obviously with London Metal Exchange, with our growing, you know, a commodity f franchise, we have more and more to offer, but they need to feel that what we have to offer is what they need. I think there, the challenge is finding that common ground. So that continued to remain to be a major, um, you know, initiative, you know, in the pipeline that we will continue to be talking with them. On the other hand, we also feel that uh, we want to control our own fate, put our own fate in our own hands. So we essentially, our commodity strategy is while we can serve Hong Kong as a connector for them if they need it, but on the other hand, in case they don't need it, which is a distinctive likelihood they don't think they may need it, mm. then we just have to figure out a way to do it ourselves. So our strategy is buy one outside, build one inside. So we bought London Metal Exchange. We're now building a Shanghai commodity mm. trading center on spot, not on futures. And where are we with the uh, Tianhai? Um, early um, stage. Early stage. Is early early stage. Okay. Have lot we got of members work. yet? Any members yet? Do we have a timeline for the Tianhai? Well, Ch that's going to be a long work in progress. Um, we're not launching an uh, exchange, which is not currently regulatory permitted. So we will be starting only doing spot, okay. meaning trade finance. It really put a credit system into the warehouse system. Mm -hmm. Essentially build an enemy look-alike warehouse system because unless you have the physical you know, system in there, because China's biggest problem today is that on the one hand, you have excessive capital sitting in the veins of the blood system, not doing anything and not having a productive access to investing. On the other hand, you have small and the medium enterprises having tremendous difficulty accessing to affordable financing. So the key problem is that money is trapped in the big SOE banks, and then the banks giving money to the big SOEs who don't really need money, and they ended up with a lot of excessive capacity. Our job, our vision and aspiration is to basically create a commodity bank, so to speak, to allow physical commodities to be, become you know, receipt, mm -hmm. warehouse receipt, a warehouse warrant, so that they can actually, a piece of paper can be financed. The bank actually trusts the piece of paper represent actual physical goods in a system. And when can, when, is, is there a time frame for Tianhai, for the spot, for? Um... Spot means it's going to be a long time. So it doesn't matter when we open up for business, it means it's going to take a long time for us to get there. Okay. You know, and uh, obviously if they give us a license to begin trade forward, sure. it's becoming easier. Okay. But we are prepared to go the long haul. Okay, and coming back to the LME, obviously the, the fees, um, you know, there has been, um, people have been quite critical, they've been looking. Um, when can we expect the LME to cut some of the fees that were brought in when um, HTX took over? 
No, we actually raised the fees, uh, you know. And yeah, that, but when can we expect them to be cut? Um, okay, well, y you assume we have to cut them, right? And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I generally don't like to cut fees. Um, and uh, so we, we, we obviously, LME was a, a, a member-owned mutual exchange and eventually become, um, you know, now it's becoming fully commercialized. And that commercialization uh, you know, was largely uh, you know, characterized you know, in many, many different ways. We made it modern exchange. We made the technology a lot better. We made it compliance a lot better. It's a modern exchange today. But going with it is that we significantly increased the, the overall fees, oh. reflecting a commercial basis that now we're operating rather than a member-owned, mutual-owned uh, exchange. In that fee commercialization, looking back, I think we probably have increased certain fees too much and increased other fees not okay. enough. Okay. So it's the, it's the mix of fees rather than cutting fees. Okay. It's the rebalancing of that fees, short carries, for example. Uh, you know, it's an essential part of the enemy behavior, trading behavior. It may or may not necessarily have anything to do with the physical side of it, but it's a very important feature to get liquidity into the enemy. We probably increase that fees a little bit too much. We probably will knock it back. But there are, us, us, there are a huge amount of OTC trade that have things happen either because of regulatory reasons and sometimes also because partially because of the fees, have sort of left the exchange, and, but those fees really, they have not, you know, huge businesses were conducted based on enemy prices. Yeah. And that need to be rebalanced, reflecting our intellectual property rights, need to have a commercial return, and we are figuring that out. Okay. Net and net, we probably hope over time will become mutual, and then the rest becoming how to expand LME, how to grow LME into more businesses. We just launched uh, gold yes. in, Hong, in uh, Precious in London for the first time, and it's going very well, and uh, it's, it's one of the most successful products that LME has ever launched okay. uh, in your new products. We will be opening it up very shortly to the audience. I just wanted to just wrap it up, just, um, just two quick questions for me. Obviously, you're born in Beijing, raised in northwestern Gansu province. <laughs> Um, you, you study journalism at Alabama, law at Columbia University. You had a stint as, as, an, sub, uh, as an editor and reporter at the China Daily, various um, Wall Street banks, and now HKEX. On that career journey, what was a defining moment for you on that path? I, that, answering that question, presume I'm very important, so, you know, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I, I, I tend to think I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And I think uh, obviously there are a number of moments that was very important, you know, uh, you know, going to America, you know, uh, at a time when there was very, very little to look up to in China. That was a moment that I thought I was never coming back. And coming back to China, to Hong Kong, you know, literally 12 years later, I uh, know actually just about nine, 10 years later, you have a very totally different perspective. So that sort of a go out and come back, that obviously a very, very important moment in my life. And obviously I have a very short attention span, so I've done a number of different things. And um, you know, so. And HKEX, so when you finish your tenure at the HKEX, um, how would you like to measure your, how would you measure your success after more than seven years? Um, well. I don't really think along those terms. Again, those terms assumes that I'm doing something quite important. And uh, is there something that uh, you would like to have? To have well, um, the, yeah, I think uh, you know, you know, putting Hong Kong Exchange into that critical junction. As I said, we are between rocks and between big different things that we have very little control. How to find a way to fit ourselves into a place where? All the key stakeholders find us to be very useful and indispensable, and we create, you know, um, I don't know what's the gears, right? You know, uh, you know, in a mechanic, you right. know, system, you have yeah. all the gears. Sometimes the smallest gear may actually turn out to be the most important gear because we are the one who can, you know, make the two big wheels move. We're in the middle of moving very fast and trying to get the other gears to move. 
lock ourselves into that into, so that we can enjoy continued and sustained success and also have a system, a DNA that is constantly looking that this is not going away and you're not going to really grab the other gears anymore and you need to find a different ways to either increase the size or decrease the size or having a different dimension. I think that is really something I want to put into the exchange that we are a unique organization in Hong Kong that both have important government and public interest mandate at the same time completely commercial and we are having a tremendously you know, deep root into a rule of law of a Hong Kong traditional English common law, open market, capitalist economy, you know, DNA, but have a tremendous understanding and appreciation of the difficulties China is going through and to be able to connect that with the distinctively vibrant international community okay. and serving that role. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much, Charles. We're going to open it up to the floor now. We have, I think we have two microphones going around. Um, so if anybody has any questions. Hi, Charles. Um, Stock Connect, hugely successful. My question is, what impact, if any, do you think the end investor ID introduction will have? Yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, the investor ID is a very technical issue, uh, you know, as to whether or not there are going to be some visibility as to who is trading. Because the domestic system is a very different system than ours. And, uh, and I think um, there is the desire for them to feel that they wanted to at least see who might be trading on the North Bond. There are concerns that some of the domestic investors have moved to Hong Kong and, then, and, and they started to trade North Bond uh, without them being able to see it. I think the broader philosophical issue um, that sometimes this topic carries is really the different way we regulate and we organize our market. I think uh, you know the international market is a tiered market. The exchange work with its members, which broker dealers, and then the clients are behind them. This is the model that has grown, has you know grown for a hundred some years. Have a fundamental, coherent, and great logic to it. The broker dealers are powerful entities because they have client assets you know, under their management that they are able to do a lot of things financially motivated and, uh, and, uh, and they provide services and help and risk manage. They're the frontline risk manager of the exchange and the central market operator. China started that way as well. But 15 some years ago, there's massive problems with the broker dealer community because people start to move customers money and then start to speculate on those and it's, it's a you know head I win tail you lose so the sovereign ended up having to hold a bag for the whole thing so as a result of that because of their sort of a central market regulator structure they are capable and they're able to essentially made a fundamental change to essentially take the broker dealer out of it made into a flat system it's a, you know, it's a, it's a see-through system. Everything is all controlled by the central clearinghouse and the exchange and the custody bank. That system serves China well. That system probably is the only way they want it to go because of the massive retail base and the retail, not only is retail, it's retail directly participating in the market. So they're going to see a lot of fundamental advantages in that. Sometimes they, they want to promote that system you know, outside China. We do recognize certain benefit of that system on the regulatory side. And if you ask any policemen, different countries' policemen, when they get together, what do they do? They compare whose gun is bigger, right? You know, that's, that's what they do. And, but sometimes bigger gun might be good in particular market. A smaller gun probably serve a different market better. We actually think our current market structure works perfectly. But when you have that market connecting though, when you have the two regulator have a very different level of trust that allow connect to happen here that is not going to happen anywhere else easily, they also require us to take a very fresh perspective in looking at their system and to the extent we are able to give them comfort by adopting certain changes in our market structures that give them the comfort they need but without necessarily affecting our fundamental logic of our own market, I think that's something we will do. And that trust level 
is the one that keep us ahead of everybody else. Everybody else is going to go them to say, oh, philosophically, I think you're wrong. We're right. They're going to say, you're wrong. We're right. That is never going to get anywhere. But we're going to say, we can see it makes sense. But please don't make us do everything you do. But there are things that is truly important to you. We will do it for you. And conversely, if there are certain things that are truly important to us, you will help us as well. So that sort of a mutual understanding on things like that allow us to continue to build the confidence and trust level between the two regulators rather than consider this to be, you know, you know, oh, somebody's pressuring us you know, into doing something we don't want it. It is all something, it's totally voluntary. We have, have our own core interests. They have their own core interests. But in the end, finding a ways to help each other is what we wanted to do because that helped both of us. Any more questions? Hi, sorry, asking behind you. No. Um, diversity is increasingly a hot topic around the globe. There's 30% uh, clubs uh, all over the world, including Hong Kong. Um, you have two female government-appointed uh, females on your board, and I believe two women on your management committee, um, which I think is at around 15% representation. What is your aspiration from a diversity perspective? And I guess, how do you see the Hong Kong exchange showing leadership uh, around diversity? Well, I, the, f the easier thing for me to do is to take a bunch of men off from my <laughs> management committee. <laughs> that ratio will go up, uh, hopefully. Uh, just joking aside, uh, I think uh, you know, there is a, a tremendous commitment to that. And in the exchange, you know, maybe similar to other organizations, the exchange, if you look at the top, I think that ratio is probably not as you know, inspiring uh, as we would like it to be. But if you look at our next layer, the exchange is heavily, you know, um, you know, it's very balanced and in some ways actually is, you know, if we have to have affirmative action in some of the other functions that we have, it's the other way around. And I think as a whole organization, you know, I think we need to do better at the top. And I think <coughs> on board levels, um, you know, we, you know, I think we're making very, very conscientious efforts, you know, even at the management level. But I don't believe in aspiring to specific quotas and specific quantitative measures, because sometimes you have to make business decisions, you know, based on, you know, uh, you know, for example, the size of the management committee. Um, you know, uh, there are many factors to consider ra uh, other than, um, you know, uh, so, so, so the ratio, you know, but the two female uh, representative on the senior management committee actually arguably are the most important. You know, we have our head of legal, general counsel is, uh, is a woman, and uh, she probably exercises a huge amount of power within the organization. The head of HR, which is also a member of the senior management committee, is a woman. And she exercised, again, tremendous amount of power. And the most of the important decisions on rem, you know, remuneration and, uh, and the hiring, are some of the most important decisions on compliance and uh, on you know, uh, you know, uh, conduct issues, you know, arguably you know, the two of them play a much bigger role than the number may suggest. But I think uh, it's a journey. And we have to, at some point, we, I'm also, when we are looking at my successor into the future, you know, we have some pretty good names, you know, uh, there. And, um, and uh, hopefully at some point, either my immediate successor or his, or, uh, his successor, uh, if we are not able to achieve that, you know, could be a woman. Yeah. We probably need to um, wrap it up. We can probably take one very, very quick question because Charles is on a tight deadline as well. So one more. I, I can do it. As long as you can. We can do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Horace Ma from S Culture. Uh, I quite like your analogy being a uh, traffic cop. So uh, the problem is uh, how the traffic cop make judgments uh, 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 taking out you know, bad guys from the traffic. So the recent case is about uh, the early call to delist some of the companies. So what are the judgments behind or the principles behind early the list to, to order companies to delist because they are no longer suitable for listing? You mean delisting? Yeah, delisting. Yeah. 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 And 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 the second and the second one is uh, how investors like us being protected because these companies like that company walking in the market they're still trading but you know people don't see any future in them but existing investors 
how, how are they going to, you know, bail out? Yeah, I think, I think um, um, delisting is a very, uh, uh, can be a challenging subject because, uh, you know, you're dealing with people who are already listed there. You're dealing with companies that uh, fundamentally delisting is a huge economic blow to that company. And it's also for investors who are already in that company is a very big issue. So uh, we historically have had a, a more uh, laissez-faire kind of attitude on delisting. And we essentially, uh, and, you know, in the past are not very aggressive in that space. We sort of uh, historically trusted that if the company is not trading that well, it's have very thin liquidity, investors usually know better. And uh, so we, you know, I, I think, uh, and also there is this fundamental belief, uh, you know, in the system that, uh, you know, no retroactive application of the law. You know, if people already decided to list here on basis on the old rules, you cannot just, uh, you know, change the rules. So many ways, from a regulatory philosophy perspective, people sometimes criticize us for not being as responsive and quick as the Chinese authority, for example. I agree with that, you know, and, but in a democracy and in, a, a, you know, a, a place where rule of law prevails, you know, our powers are limited. We cannot act too quickly and too fast which also means that uh, our rules have a greater predictability and greater stability, and people are able to react and comment rather than arbitrarily, we decided, we decided we're smart enough and we want to do something new in the market, bam, new regulation comes out in the afternoon. And then, you know, I think uh, there is, I think we can do better, but I think um, getting delisting for new, com for existing companies is something that require another consultation, a lot of that, and I think uh, we will listen to the chief executive. We're trying to be a little bit less consultation obsessive. And, uh, <laughs> we'll do that. That's why one of the reasons I want to do a new board is to make sure the new board has a delisting regime that is tremendously more aggressive and more effective. And this way, since people are listing no that this is sort of things that uh, is in the system. Investors investing in this kind of a companies know that this company, if it traded beyond, be below a certain level or something happens, will get delisted. Easy in, easy out, the system is clean, rather than you get clocked it with old you know, system that just refused to go away. I think uh, it's much easier for us to do that. That's why we keep saying we would like to have a new board and the new board allows delisting to be quickly because going back, affecting something that is already there, it's difficult, but we'll take your, you know, your point. I think in the past, some of our sectors, uh, uh, problematic sectors, are w very well known for Hong Kong investors. Most investors stay away from them. It's a little subculture there. It's almost like a city, every city have a couple of streets that is a little bit darker, and, uh, and some, some stuff is going on there, and the police sort of know sort of a harmless and all not really. So we occasionally go there and then put the flashlight there and, uh, and uh, we don't really do a whole lot because you, know, you have to take pretty heavy weapons that could affect other innocent citizens. On the other hand, today, a lot of tourists started coming in. The tourists don't know better. The new guys don't know better. They just say, oh, there's some funny stuff going on. There's interesting stuff, exciting stuff going on. They get there and get trapped and get cheated. So today, <laughs> So today, the police will make a few more rounds. And we are making a lot more rounds now. And we're shutting down a few, you know, places. And we're checking people's fire licenses and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, health and, you know, licenses and everything a lot more aggressively. So we're going to do a little bit of that. If we find a shop that is not doing something, maybe we'll close it a little bit later. But we have to do it still with more predictable rules and rather than just, uh, you know, a, a quick reaction to popular and disconnect. Uh, just can I, can I draw, draw a quick conclusion that there are more delisting coming? <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't know whether you're from the press, uh, <laughs> no. because that's what they wanted to hear. And uh, you know, uh, my friends, you know, my media friends are back know better. That's not what I said. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but more, list, more delisting, definitely. Uh, you know, and, uh, but whether it happens over the next few months, over the next couple of years, I don't really know. But again, it won't really go without a process for people to fully understand it because they are fundamental economic interests at stake. 
you know, for investors, obviously, you don't want this bad behavior to continue. But for people who are already in there, they need due process for their interest to be somehow negatively affected. And thank you very much. Um, I don't know if anyone has. Charles actually also will be having a stand up with media in the other room there. Oh, very okay. Um, <laughs> thank you so much thank for you. joining us today. Um, okay, thank Charles you. Charles Lee, Chief Executive of Hong Kong Exchanges and Engineering. And afterwards, there will be some coffee and refreshments for anybody who wants to um, stay around here um, for a while. Thank you all very much. Thank you. That was fun.